The proliferation of cheap thermal devices are transforming the threat landscape of conflict zones. They basically undo all your carefully applied camouflage and make you glow up with direct line of sight. They are becoming a very attractive option for someone who can't swing even a single tube PVS-14. I knew I had to get my hands on one to do some testing. So here's all I could afford for now. This is the AGM Rattler V2, 25 millimeter field of view with a 256 resolution. Now I know what you're thinking. 256 resolution, that sounds terrible. Is that like watching a 240p YouTube video? Well, until you consider that price increases with the square of the resolution and even the high end high resolution optics are still only 640 by 512. But high resolution graphics aren't necessarily the whole enchilada with these thermal optics. You're the information you're trying to receive is, is that a human out there or a dog? Or is that a car or a moose? It's not, is that my friend Billy or my friend Bob? I mean, sometimes at a great range, all you're looking for is any heat signature at all. And this allows you to identify where the potential threats are. So how do thermals work? So thermal devices work by detecting heat signatures. So every object emits some level of infrared radiation based on its temperature. Even cold objects will emit some thermal radiation. This is called the black body radiation. When things get hot enough, the radiation emitted is in the visible spectrum. So that's why this stovetop will glow red. And the super hot sun provides a nice white light. But things much cooler than that, such as the heat given off from the human body and other room temperature objects, they emit light in the long infrared wavelength. Thermal cameras capture this radiation and convert it to an image where hotter objects are highlighted. This allows you to see in complete darkness, provided there is thermal contrast between objects that you're looking at. This works differently from, say, night vision devices like the PVS-14, which do need some ambient light to amplify, or else an IR illuminator. These see in the near-infrared spectrum. Thermals, on the other hand, are better for seeing through smoke or fog and detecting body heat at great range in complete darkness. NVGs, on the other hand, are better suited for navigation and maneuvers in darkness as they provide more visual information about your surroundings. Now, besides resolution, one spec you will have to decide on for your thermal is the field of view. The larger the diameter of your lens, the tighter the field of view and the more zoomed in your image will be. For detection, I recommend a wider field of view. This will also be easier to mount on a rifle because the larger optics, they just get kind of bulky. So my 25 millimeter optic has a fixed three and a half X magnitude zoom, which makes it difficult for near in engagement. But for identification, you're going to want as much visual info on your target as possible. So a high res tight field of view will be desirable. That's why nighttime coyote and hog hunters often mount their rifles on tripods because they're so unwieldy. A wider field of view gives you a broader panoramic view, which is great for situational awareness, but it gives you less detail. A narrower field of view offers much more detail at distance, useful for precise target identification, but with less area to cover, it is going to be like looking through a paper towel tube, and it's not going to give you a very broad picture of the landscape. So choose your optic based on your operational needs. Do you want a handheld or a weapon mounted optic? That will depend on how you plan to use it. Is this going to be in an observation post for hunting, uh, mounting on a sentry gun? 
Handheld thermals are more versatile. They're great for recon, scanning large areas, and when you need to move your device around freely or check different directions without moving your weapon. Because weapon-mounted optics, they are specifically for aiming and engaging targets, so you're not going to want to be holding your rifle all the time when you're just scanning. They will keep your hands free to handle your weapon, though, and providing you a direct line of sight through your firearm's optic. So that's obviously crucial in tactical situations where you want to be fighting while remaining undetected. But to be honest, every time I put this thing on my rifle, I end up taking it off again to use as a handheld. So I do like having the ability to use it as a weapon optic, but as a civilian, you will be much more likely to need intel rather than a firefight. I mean, who needs a firefight? Handhelds are a bit cheaper anyway, so something to think about. Uh, one interesting thing that I want to talk about mechanically about thermals is inside there is a little shutter usually, and that shutter will close periodically to recalibrate the mechanism. And it needs, sometimes after a while, the image will get a little bit grainy, and that's because it will lose that difference between the magnitude of the, the heat signatures. And so it needs to recalibrate by looking at a thermally uniform uh, temperature. So, but the problem is this will cause your your image to freeze for a few seconds. So if you are in a tactical situation, that could mess you up. So you're able to turn that automatic recalibration off. And then whenever you have a free moment, you can manually trigger the calibration. And it only takes about a second on mine. So, uh, but you don't want that to be a second where you're being shot at. Now, before we talk about thermal camouflage, I did want to highlight this one key distinction about detection range versus identification range. Even with this 256 resolution optic, I can detect objects with a heat signature very far away, miles away. But it might just be a few glowing pixels on the screen. I'm not going to know what it is. So the identification range is much closer. It's when you can recognize what that something is. I mean, for instance, I can detect and identify the heat signature of the moon from here on Earth. That's hundreds of thousands of kilometers away. But a little squirrel in the tree, I can only detect the signature of. I can't necessarily tell what it is other than just the knowledge of, yeah, it's obviously a squirrel. But even heat-seeking missiles when, when there's nothing but sky to look at, uh, you can be chasing little pixels that are your heat signature that you're homing in on the aerial threat. I'm just trying to get you to think about the use cases of thermal devices. They're not, they're not a silver bullet. They don't allow you to see everything in crystal clear detail, but they are extremely powerful for what they can do. So this brings us to the topic that was half my reason for investing in the thermal. Testing thermal camouflage techniques. Hiding from thermals is very difficult because we are not cold-blooded reptiles. Most of us anyway. And that will always be giving off some sort of heat signature. The best way to hide from a thermal is to put some material that is opaque to long-wave infrared in between you and the observer, such as glass. And funny story, when I bought the optic, uh, I was excited to try it out, even sitting there in my car, and I was like, what? I can't see anything. Oh, duh, I have to roll the windows down. So <laughs> I can't see through windows. Um, so that's an interesting thing about the thermal. And the lens itself is actually not glass, of course, because that's opaque to IR. So it needs to be the this germanium lens, which is really cool. The problem is if that material that you're using to hide behind is also in contact with your body, it will begin to emit a heat signature itself. So, for example, if I put on a suit of armor that was made out of glass or something that was thermally opaque, 
it's, if it's touching my body or very close to it, it will start to heat up and then it's emitting your heat signature anyway. So that's a problem. Now you've probably heard of the old space blanket hack. So this is better than nothing, I'd say, but it does have several problems. It is thermally reflective, so sometimes you'll stand out by reflecting the temperature of the sky or something that doesn't really fit with the surroundings. It also will get warm if it's in contact with your body. So good thermal camo will have some non-reflective outer layer and multiple layers so that the outer layer is as close to the temperature of the surroundings as possible. So to give you an extreme example of this, the James Webb Space Telescope is essentially able to blot out the thermal signature of the sun using a very efficient multi-layer insulation blanket. So the IR camera looking at galaxies billions of light years away is the same temperature as the space, which is at very cold cryogenic temperatures. Remember, the thing that makes you stand out to thermals is contrasting temperature, not just the temperature itself. It would be very easy to hide among a bunch of sun-warmed boulders, for example. So coming up with strategies to make you appear the temperature of the surroundings is the whole key for hiding from thermals. So let's take a look at some testing that I did. Now here is an example of me putting on a regular rain poncho. And as you can see, even though it was fairly thick material, it is almost completely transparent to IR. You can see you can see my hands through it, almost as if it was clear plastic. So this does basically nothing to mask your thermal signature. And that is to be expected. But let's take a look at what happens when you put on a thermal poncho. So this is a thermal poncho. It's basically made out of the same mylar of a space blanket, but it has a non-reflective outer layer, or at least less reflective. As you'll see, it still does reflect a little bit of IR light. This by itself would not make a very good thermal camouflage because it has very open hood, open sides, and it doesn't cover the legs, uh, regardless of the fact that it's still only one layer and it starts to glow after a while by itself. And here you can see when I hold it up, the insides of it are very reflective thermally. So you can see it reflects my face when I hold it up to my face, whereas the outside of it is not quite as reflective, though it still is fairly reflective. Now here is something interesting that I wanted to try. I've heard of thermals being used as a way of detecting concealed carriers. So here I have my concealed carry weapon on my appendix, and I don't see it very well, even through the t-shirt here. Um, but as you can see, when I lift it up, it is actually quite warm already. And that is because I have been wearing this thing all day up to this point. So it is already very warm, close to the temperature of my body. And remember, the thermals detect contrast in temperature, not just temperature. So in this case, it's going to make it very hard for my weapon to be detected by a thermal device. Now, you might be able to detect it other ways, such as printing, but that's not the point of this video. So I decided to test it out. I put a revolver on my appendix that has been sitting in room temperature all day, and very quickly you start to see it through my t-shirt. So this goes to show that uh, if you have just put on your weapon, then it will be visible to the thermal devices. And even when I put another layer, you can start to see the revolver through my shirts. And it took quite a while for it to warm up. In fact, several minutes. I would say 10-15 minutes. It was still very visible. I put on a winter coat. It was not visible through the winter coat. Uh, okay, now what's he packing? Oh, it's a blunderbuss.
Uh, yeah, but I don't think you need a thermal to tell you've got a rifle under there. Also, I don't generally recommend appendix carrying an AR. So while I had been fooling around with the blunderbuss, the AR, and the revolver, I had my carry pistol in the freezer. And fortunately, I got it out of there before my wife came home and was like, what is this doing in here? But yeah, in this case, I put the frozen <laughs> pistol on my appendix and boy, was it visible. And even after I put on the outer shirt and and even the winter coat, if I undid the outer layer, if it was just the inner lining that was zipped up, you could actually see through that part. So yeah, in this case, if you're in a cold climate and you've got your your pistol in your car and then you just put it on before going into a building, yeah, if they've got thermal surveillance at the entrance, they're going to see that quite easily. So the moral of this story is always be carrying. Always have your weapon on you throughout your entire day and let it be the same temperature as your body. And then you don't need to worry about this. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this introduction video about thermal devices. I hope you learned something. I'm going to be doing much more testing with this thing in the future to both learn about thermal camouflage and also detection, identification, using it as an observation device to gather intel. So I'm really glad I invested in this thing and stay tuned for more videos about engineering the new civil defense. So if that sounds appealing to you, please follow and click the bell notification. I don't spam you. I only post at most one video per week. That is the most I can handle. But I try to do a good job with my videos so I don't waste your time. 